Alrighty, so how are you guys? I'm Jeremy. Uh, I'm a therapist um, based in Dallas at the downtown or Trammell Crow location. Um, so if you don't know me, uh, nice to meet you officially. I'm coming to you live from my guest room slash office. So uh, I'm a mental health therapist. My, my practice is called Mind Above. Uh, I put a little chat thingy in the window there. So please feel you can eat, eat, uh, put a message up on the screen. You can send it to me directly or you can just ask it out loud. Um, I, I like being real open and just having great communication for everybody so we can address some stuff. I kind of wanted to focus on some ways of handling stress and uh, what's now, you know, a lot of people are starting to label COVID fatigue and kind of reevaluate your motivations to, you know, keep going forward and how to address some of those things that could be anxiety related. It could be, you know, just this kind of experience of just feeling drawn down and lacking motivation. And, you know, we see things, we see problems, but we don't know how to address them. So one of the things I like to do is address mindset so we can actually find some steps forward so we can see little progress and we can gain momentum through our own action. Uh, anytime I'm talking, if anything sounds like BS or you're like, what the world is that hippie crunchy dude talking about, please interrupt me and ask. I, I like to make sure things are clear for everybody. Um, I get excited and I talk a lot and I use a lot of analogies and Jeremyisms. So please call me on it. If anything sounds too Dr. Phillish, uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, so. Anyway, as I was kind of breaking it down, I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about a real simple way of showing you that there's something you can do when those thoughts come to mind. So like when we talk about, um, you know, with COVID-19, for instance, a lot of time we can start identifying our problems and our faults. And this occurs with or without a pandemic. Uh, and so I call it the identification phase. And so it's where we're, we're fixating on a problem. And sometimes you hear people say those should, would, could statements, I, you know, like, um, for instance, I know I should be working out, but I just can't get the motivation. I just don't know what to do. And like, so we'll say some kind of definitive problem, but we don't connect it to an actual path of, you know, a way to address it, or we'll say something we need to do and we'll tell ourselves, we know exactly what we need to do and how to address it, but our reasoning comes into play. And so we don't count for as the, uh, emotional reasoning is something that I can incur. And a lot of times, you know, I talk with clients that are, you know, intellectually functioning, very smart, productive, capable people, but then the motivation starts to wane. And so a lot of times it can be related to your emotional reasoning. And so what we do is we rationalize. And so we're losing motivation, we're losing interest, we're pulling back, we kind of have some little signs of some of the, you know, worries and doubts and fatigue. And then we rationalize the behavior and we tell ourselves, I know I need to do this, but I just can't. And then we kind of just step away and we pull away from it and we minimize what we're doing is saying it's not good enough or it's not addressing the whole problem. So then therefore it's kind of invalid. Um, so that's something that kind of can help with our mindset is the way that we address these things and make them something that is, takes us out of just identification and moves us into a lot of times when we talk about mindfulness, we get hear these words like acceptance and awareness. And I like to really like take that and take it a step further. So then it's something you can actually, you know, like, put to you in your heart and be able to address it so that it's something that's meaningful and purposeful um, because breathing is great don't get me wrong i'm the biggest like if you ever sat through a lunch and learning before i'll go through breathing and all kinds of stuff we did a chocolate meditation if you got to sit through that before so i'm a big mindfulness fan don't get me wrong i have nothing against mindfulness what i like to do though is i like to bring it into a real world awareness so we can actually you know handle your situation and your need uh, and so I'm going to put up a slide on the screen. I'll share this on the Slack as well. Um, but something that can occur when we're in that state is we will get stuck with the identification state and we'll lose sight of taking it into an acknowledgement and an acceptance is the next stage. So like when we acknowledge something, we're going to be looking at it from the standpoint of what am I able to do about it? I see this thing, I acknowledge it and I understand it's weighing down on me. So like for me, what I'll do is I'll have to be very honest with my thoughts and feelings. Like I, uh, you know, as a therapist, I'll go from talking to people about motivation, I'll talk to people, the next client could be talking about a domestic violence situation, the next client could be talking about suicidality, the next client could be talking about happiness and progress and the fact that things are going so well, they don't know why they're still in therapy. So my point being is you have to be able to engage, disengage, adjust, reorient, focus on what the priorities are, and navigate those you know, active concerns while also bringing yourself some reminder of connecting to self. So you know, 
we don't get stuck in just seeing a problem and getting stuck with it and not getting past it and putting it into this willful avoidance where we just push it to the side until it finally falls off the cliff. Um, with the acceptance, a lot of times that's a place where people get confused, I think, is that it seems that we feel that we, it, we have to do this, like I call like Eeyore, that is what it is. I'm sorry, that's one of my pet peeves as a therapist. Uh, it is what it is. Thinking is very static and it, it just tells us that we're stuck and there's nothing that can be done. And what we want to consider is it is what it could be or what we want it to be. So how am I going to make it better? And, you know, how am I going to direct the change that I'm trying to create? Uh, let's see here. Can I share a slide in here? Or should I do it on Slack? Anybody? Let's you can... You can share your screen if you want to show. Okay, cool. I'll your, do that. That slide. So while I'm doing that, does anybody have any uh, questions so far at all or anything? You can put it up in the. I see the chat, or you can just ask while I'm pulling up the slide. No pressure to be the first person. Uh, let's see here. Okay. All right, cool. And then now you guys have disappeared off my screen. Hang one second, let me open this up. Sorry. Okay, can you guys see the slide? I'm gonna make it bigger. Yes, we can see the slide. Sweet, all right, cool. So this is what I'm talking about. Uh, I like the visual stuff, so I put this together right before we started. And it's just a step process. Um, you know, some of us in the that are businessy kind of, you know, obviously the common desk, a lot of us have business oriented uh, stuff going on. And I like to break down lists. So it's to me something we can remind ourselves of. And I'll just put this on Slack so you guys can use it. And you can totally update this and you can totally take my name and mind above off it and take credit for it. That's fine. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Just as long as it brings you some kind of value or goodness, that's my biggest thing. Um, so the identification step, like I said earlier, that's where we get into problem thinking. We only think about the problem and we only consider the problem and everything else is guided by the problem. So what happens there too is we only see a problem and we don't see much else around it. And so as we try to shove it aside, that's where we get that broken thinking that doesn't allow us to go into acknowledging it fully and accepting it as it is. And so what is that feeling? What is that thought that you're stuck with? And then owning it as it is. Instead of saying, oh, I feel sad, this makes me depressed, or I don't know how to feel, I feel anxious, and then trying to push it away because it's a bad feeling, it's saying, hey, it's okay that I feel bad. It's okay that I don't know what the hell tomorrow brings because I might not. There's things that are inside our control and outside of control, but in that moment, it's okay to feel bad and it's okay to understand that you may not know every solution and answer. And so then that's where we start to acknowledge the weight of the problem and we see how it's affecting us. So we're starting to put more definition. I really like diving into definition of problems so that way it doesn't just become this minimized thing that we push away and then you can more clearly identify it. Because sometimes a lot of people talk to me in therapy and they'll tell me something like, oh, I'm just sad all the time and they settle. And so then it's, okay, well, that's the problem. Well, I'm sad, but what, why? What's going on? What's bringing you to sadness? Let's dive in deeper so you can have a better understanding. When we dive in deeper, that's when we work towards what's actually called acceptance. And we see it as it is in the actual truth of it. So when we do that, what's interesting is in this mental health process, we're actually taking some of the weight off just by actually being a little bit of vulnerable. So if you're Brene, Brene, Brene Brown fan, shout out to her. She talks about vulnerability at length. Uh, you can find her thing on Netflix. I know she's got a special on there. Um, but when you get into that step, you start to pull and shed the weight of the problem off because we oftentimes, when we get stuck in problem thinking and identification only, we will weigh it more than it's worth. We will put extra emphasis on it and it occupies more of our soul, our thought, our process, our mind than it should. And that comes from inside of us and how we can see it as it truly is and for what it is. So that way we can move forward. Um, the next thing is getting into that motivation. So motivation and action, I put this on here, is your motivation increase action. So what I mean by that is, you know, some simple things you can do. Um, if you read business journals and some, you know, mindfulness stuff, some of the, you know, the terminology updates all the time and people come up with little nuanced ways of saying something that's really, you know, cool and chic or whatever. Uh, so micro task. Micro task is like really small, like no BS, I can do this no matter how crappy I feel today. Um, like you could do it 
easily. It's just the one little step. Like for instance, if I, you know, if you're at home and you're staying at home, uh, you know, Olivia mentioned something right before we started about like, Hey, my environment, uh, sit at the kitchen table and I find myself avoiding the kitchen table because it's my workspace. And that's, you know, a good way of kind of helping us, you know, disconnect from the work mind mentality so we can get to our own personal existence in life, even though we're in the same physical space. Um, you know, something that occurs too, though, in, you know, our motivation in action cycle is we want to accomplish small tasks. So small tasks might like be like Marie Kondo, you know, the living room and organize my stack of magazines and color code my book collection or whatever. Um, you know, I always smile when I see the design team at Common Desk because there's always like this deep thought and like the little nuanced details and it, it shows, which is fun for me because I have an office across from the library area. So I see that as a, a neat little uh, challenge that, you know, people put a lot of emphasis in and, you know, make it look really representative of a space. So some things we could do is, you know, simple steps in our own home. Is this space representative of me feeling good? Does this make me feel, you know, like I'm in my fortress of solitude? You know, I'm, I'm a comic book fan. So, you know, forgive me if I bring up Superman or anything like that. So you know, this is my space to recuperate, recharge, renew, feel better about my existence and feel I am safe and secure. So that's something, you know, we look around as we're on the Zoom call is like, what's outside the camera shot? You know, is, is my bed made? Is these kind of simple things? Those are micro tasks we can do daily. It's just finding a step to try one and see if it works. And if it doesn't adjust, it's okay. And just the fact that you tried something is important because that's where we're going to start to see progress is just that going back to acknowledgement. So we kind of repeat step two, Hey, I actually am trying. Um, then when we start to feel more motivated, we increase that slowly. And then we start to see more action because things are more doable and they're more approachable because we created that out of us, out of our mind, our mentality. So our emotions like point at my heart for that, our emotions and our mind come together and they culminate and what that turns into is your cognitive experience, your behavior, your thoughts, the things that you actually share with the world or share with yourself even, because sometimes we get locked in thought and we don't even address it. So how we get into that step of actually making action towards something. And our actions are going to increase tenfold when we experience the next one I put on there is validation. So with validation, this is where we see success. A lot of times when we are focused on success, we think of it in the mentality of our work life experience. And we tell ourselves success in work is me getting that deal closed, me, you know, getting a commission, me finishing that project, me getting that, you know, client report in on time. And so we see that as our validation or like if some boss, we have somebody down the line says, Hey, great job on that project. Great job in that presentation. We feel validated. So that's an external validation. Internally, we've got to do some repair work because oftentimes internally, we will twist our own internal validation into external acceptance. So if Jeremy says, hey, you're doing a great job, that makes you feel good. But if Jeremy doesn't say anything, then we're like, oh my God, he didn't tell me I felt good. Am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? Is this good? Am I good enough? Am I doing so much that it's too much? And we just start questioning and questioning our own experience to the point that we break down and separate from the progress that we've created. My thing I want to tell you is it's okay to validate yourself internally. I don't want you to be arrogant about it. I want you to be considerate and be so self-aware that you see how you affect yourself and then to bring in a nuanced cycle of change, get you out of that closed loop thinking where everything is problem, everything is stuck and everything can't be better. So with that validation cycle, your own internal validation is just as equally important or more than the external validation that we try to seek, the praise, the approval, and things like that. Same thing in our relationships. Sometimes we are the people pleaser. We will go above and beyond, and we will create an imbalance of dependence on what we do and our actions. So then other people are become dependent on how they can gain from us. And it's not about we're enabling people. It's just that, hey, we find ourselves pushing harder, and it makes them accustomed to it, or vice versa. We get used to other people doing things, and then we feel like, well, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to take away from them. They always do this. So why, why should I do something different? Um, and that kind of transition to the last thing I wanted to talk about is your purpose, is finding your purpose. How do I take this cycle, open it up, examine it, allow myself to take each step slowly with understanding, with humble acknowledgement, 
and allow myself to not feel overwhelmed and not feel that I'm bad and not put any judgment on myself. It is to do this with this radical acceptance that, hey, even if you feel outside where you need to be or you're feeling that you're not accomplishing what you're supposed to, it's okay that you're just taking a moment to actually identify it and then step into this process so you actually will address it so then you can actually achieve that thing you keep telling yourself you're going to do that change you're going to make or you need to make so with your purposes when you find that validation you can't stop there because oftentimes that's the other thing we do we get in this sense of oh i got validated my boss said i did a good job hey i got a you know i got a you know award for employee of the month or hey i've you know i feel like this was something good i re signed up for a new college class and we'll stop right there. But then we don't do is it connect it to our purpose. So our purpose is something that I find extremely important that we will walk away from because we say it once or we say it inconclusively. And so there's this undefined, not specific existence. And like, I know I'm just supposed to do good because doing good is what I'm supposed to do. So we have this very vague expectation of what our purpose is and we can't actually specifically address it. I want you to feel encouraged to actually find a way to find your no BS ironclad purpose. So then you can connect it to everything you do daily and take it into your motivation and just foster a growth, foster a new experience. So then it's something that takes you into the next level that you've been trying to get to for over and over again. And, you know, it's about taking our motivations and all that, you know, leadership and stuff that we want and all those changes and personal things that we bring to it. But it's about connecting all the dots and seeing that, Hey, here's a clear path forward that I am actually creating. Um, and so it's reinvesting in that. And that's that where we come back into, we repeat this cycle, but now you got to think if I've addressed the problem, then the next identification is going to be on what's the next thing I can do. So one problem at a time, is where we could start. And so if it's one little micro task you can do to address a problem, you're made progress. Congratulations, quit beating yourself up, get off your butt and move forward. You have this ability inside of you right now to do more because of your own internal drives than anything I can offer you or anything the external world can give you. It's about how you can activate that change and how you can use this kind of example thinking to increase from a static, the Eeyore mindset, I'm a big Winnie the Pooh fan, and transition into a dynamic mindset. So going into dynamic, that's where we sit, hit, set our goals, like Winnie the Pooh, want to get that honey, how do I get that honey? My honey is the focus, my honey is my goal, boom, you know, congratulations, Winnie the Pooh will adapt and overcome. That's a dynamic mindset. And then we transition even further as we really get into this stuff and we get into a more rounded understanding of self and that's where we transition into a positive mind frame so even though we're handling mass amounts of email mass amounts of information mass amounts of communication coordination and we're all separated by a remote need and we all have this thing by the way it's called the global pandemic on top of that and we're trying to act normal it's okay to find a place to address that and you know either through yourself either through me or somebody else that's a professional or through a friend or a trusted family member. So that way you have a place to check for some validation, find some more acceptance for yourself and for others, and then share that knowledge with others as well so that they can have a more positive experience. Um, but yeah, you know, purpose is what really is gonna be something that fosters your own growth and your own healing. And it can be great to transition into an existence professionally, personally, and individually. Because oftentimes that's the last thing we do is we don't like to put focus on ourselves because we feel selfish for that. So I'm going to see here. I saw some chat pop up. So any questions on that so far? Feel free to guys interject anytime. I'm going to try to see the chat window. Sorry, I couldn't see it. Okay, cool. See, creative fatigue, Zoom burnout. Yeah, Zoom burnout is real. Uh, revolves around this, yep. So this is something I wanted to talk about is what we do is when, you know, we get stuck is we will put 
this is something I talk a lot about in therapy and this is where I'm gonna get a little abstract, so bear with me. And I move my hands a lot, even on camera. So if you think I'm like casting a spell on you, like some Harry Potter shit, I apologize. Um, so the thing we do is we get stuck in projection versus embodiment. So in projection, we know that we have what we're supposed to fulfill. So we see this empty shell of expectation and we're supposed to mold ourselves with it. And so we will actually set up a movie projector in our mind and we'll project the image of what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to see, what we're supposed to experience and what others want from us. And this is where we will screw the pooch and we will tell ourselves, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is how I'm supposed to do it. So we don't have an emotional ability to resonate it. And so then we're just fulfilling an empty shell, an empty void experience. And we don't get satisfaction or validation as much as we used to. So we lose our creative spark. We lose our desire to find purpose in the things that we do daily. Now, if I can get you out of projection and I can help you transition to what I call embodiment. Embodiment is that depth, that connection, that person you meet at work that you don't just talk about the bachelor, no offense. You actually get into depth and you talk about, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What are some of the things that you need to work on? You know, I'm working on this goal and I really appreciate you just checking in with me and so we can address this either teamwork wise or just have someone to, you know, feel that you're connected with. And it could be an interpersonal communication. When you have those conversations, you know, some of us are a little more, you know, tangential than others and that's all right. But when we have those conversations where you're like, oh my God, I'm actually talking to someone. Oh my God, it's actually more than just surface level BS. And like, I actually want to actually follow up with them. That's where we start to feel that little bit of that tinge of embodiment. And that's where we get to really express the inside of who we are. So that's us that are more truthful, honest, raw self. Um, something when I talk about self and I do this example of projection versus embodiment is I bring up the idea that when we are embodying something, we have an awareness. And this is that mindfulness crap we talk about. We have an awareness that brings such depth and beauty to our own thought process that we will resonate and connect with our words through an intentional meaning. So then we can clearly define what the hell we're trying to say and why we're trying to say it and how it affects us and it affects others. That's where we can get into if we allow ourselves to take this process and put it into place. So yeah, embodiment is a huge, huge one for me. Um, and I think that, you know, us taking that and examining it and being able to share. So anybody who's on this call, you guys feel free to talk or, you know, put something in the chat box. I'm all about this being a, you know, a conversation that is meaningful and holistic and purposeful. And if you don't feel comfortable sharing online in front of others, absolutely. Okay. Reach out to me. Um, I'll put my contact info up in the, in the window in a minute. And it could be just a conversation. You don't have to come see me as your therapist. I mean, I am a licensed therapist. I do practice independently and, you know, I do telehealth for anybody in the state of Texas but it's not just about me. I'm about people getting help and support through any means, if it's professional, personal, et cetera. But if it's just a question, feel free to ask. I'm not going to charge you to talk to me. Believe me, I'm not that kind of person. Um, I think that it's important, you know, as we address these kind of resources, as we find a way to take these action steps and put them into place in our own existence, in our own place of betterment, because that's something we often seek. We'll see the problem, we'll identify the problem, and then we'll put it here you know, way off in the distance is this thing called betterment, it's success, accomplishment. And we have this gap that we build and we don't know how the hell to make a bridge. Well, if any of my people on the call are engineers or more concrete thinkers, um, then you're going to think, well, you have to build a plan. You have to make, you know, supports. You have to do rigging. You have to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you think, think logically. So my logisticians, my people that have categorical thinking, you have structure, you have meaning, you have defined purpose and values for things. So I'm married to a pharmacist. So she is an extreme logical thinker and I'm a therapist. I'm an extreme. Everything is awesome. I want to give everybody warm hugs and cookies. So our conversations can be kind of hilarious at times because our difference of thought, but that's okay. We all have thought structures that agree and identify with us personally and professionally and it's acknowledging and accepting them and being able to utilize them, but also benefit from others' views and their perspectives and kind of interconnecting that thought. So my point being is when we have this gap, we will so awesome look at the gap and say, damn, that's the Grand Canyon. How the hell do I cross that? Well, you can either evil can evil your ass and build a ramp and go as fast as you can and hope to pray that you make it to the other side, or you can slow your thinking and think logically about, huh, if I look inside my peripheral, I can see that I can go around the rim or, oh shit, there's a cable car that goes across. 
We don't have to be extreme and just ramp off the edge just because we can. Because sometimes we do that, and that's when we get into that sense of all or nothing thinking, and it has to be this or nothing else. And so I don't know about you, I'm pretty daredevilish, but I'm not going to ramp a motorcycle over the Grand Canyon. So something to be considerate of. Um, but, you know, it's about finding a purpose and finding a path. So slowing down enough to appreciate the experience you're in. So that's that Grand Canyon. That's a that problem. That's identifying the problem, but it's also accepting it, acknowledging it and accepting it. So then you can actually see the pathway through it as opposed to trying to avoid it. Because if you drove yourself all the way to Arizona right now and you're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and you're like, oh, let me get to the other side and get a picture of this. And then you turn around and you say, oh, well, maybe next time. And you drive back to Texas. Just saying, that's a lot of effort for nothing. Address the problems as they come. Don't fear them. Don't scare away from them. And sometimes we have to just be real. We may be emotionally overwhelmed and we may have to back off a problem because we just can't handle it at that time. Absolutely okay. I'm not telling you to, you know, face your fears and throw daggers at everything. I'm telling you to slow down and, hey, if it's so harsh at that moment, you have to avoid it for a little bit. Cool. Set a timer. Two hours from now, I'm going to come back and talk about that tough conversation. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to come back. I'm going to look at this. Tonight, I'm going to reflect and write my journal. Open up to things that you know address what we're going through so then we can see it, identify it, and then later when we come back to it, we can find a way to acknowledge how much it's affected us and how to accept it at the value it's at now and then begin to pull it apart so then it's not so weighted and we can actually find purpose to address it. So, but let's see here, good, 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 vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah, strengths really help. Yeah, Lily, you're right, um, is we have to remind ourselves what our strengths are because here's the thing I'm gonna tell you real quick, and this is like my most Dr. Phil thing you're gonna hear me say, I promise, I'll try to reserve them for, the, for as little as possible. I'm sorry. Every time I hear Dr. Phil, I just laugh. Um, you know, change your life by changing yourself. It's like, yes, thank you. It's like a reading a Laffy Taffy rapper. It's like, yeah, that's pretty straightforward, lame. Um, you know, with Dr. Philisms, here's what I want you to consider. And I really, really want you to think about this. And if you want to share out loud or in the box, the chat box, please do. But here's the thing that I want you to consider. No bullshit. When was the last time you actually sat down and actually told yourself that you love yourself when was the last time you actually felt self-aware to a connection and you actually were considerate of your being as it is and you were actually accepting and understanding and humble and you approached your own existence with the best value forward because even though you may not feel love for yourself right now just identifying that you deserve it is a step in the right direction think about that because if anybody else was having the experience anybody else was having a struggle we would throw all the Oprah-esque support at them. Everybody gets a free GM car. Everybody gets this. I need your help. Oh my gosh, I will help you. I will do everything for you. I'll, I will lift heaven and earth. But then when it comes to us, people ask how we're doing. Here's a therapy joke. People, I tell them, hey, how are you doing? Well, I'm good. If you tell me you're good, I'm just going to tell you I can go on a like abstract exploration of what good is that will look like a scene out of uh, you know watching uh, The Big Lebowski you know, we will, we will travel t space and time and we'll break the continuum. We will quantum leap your ass to a new existence because I want you to take it from good to a better understanding of what that actually means for you. Because your version of good is absolutely different than my version of good. And we have to see that difference is that where we find definition and understanding of what we're truly trying to express. Um, so with that being said, I know I've talked a lot. I want to kind of open it up. Does anybody have some questions or anything I can address? Don't forget you're on mute, but call the nice, polite people. So if you start talking, you don't hear me respond. I promise I'm listening. Jeremy, I have a question. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, this was very helpful, very timely. And uh, I think your insights are just on self, self-awareness and, and that journey of those five steps of those slides are just spot on. So thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Um, the number one, I work with, uh, with uh, individuals in uh, executive coaching format. What I'm dis discovering a lot of is... Um, not only I can sometimes see what you described to their own self-awareness coming out, but the biggest question that's coming up in this current environment is mm -hmm. how do I care and show up for my employees when they're in their own homes, when they're working remotely? Mm -hmm. And they're really struggling with crossing that line into, it seems overly personal to them. Like they can't ask, how are you or what's going on in your home? Because they're used to being in the sterile workplace. 
Mm -hmm. And so I see them wanting to support other people's journeys, take care of their people, but they're also, uh, maybe it's an issue with intimacy or in this environment. So I'm curious what Mm -hmm. your thoughts are on that and how I can support them better by helping them have those conversations. You know, thanks for bringing it up, Matt. And it's awesome to hear, you know, you share what you do. I love learning about you guys, everybody that's in in the call about what you guys do and the things, you know, because I see some people in passing the halls. I'm like, oh, I think I have an idea what that name of that company means. And, you know, like my mind's mind above. So people see they're like, okay, he's into some crunchy granola stuff, but I'm not sure exactly what he does. So, uh, but, you know, it's neat to learn about it. So with the coaching mindset and like that kind of identification with leadership that would be concerned. Uh, something I would utilize is something that I tell people is when you're trying to find a depth and a connection and show that you care is don't focus on what you can ask, focus on what you can display. So what I mean by that is a, a statement that I use often is I want you to exemplify the behavior that you want to exist in. If you want people to feel confident and you want them to feel capable and you want them to feel understood, well, holy hell, take a moment and share what your experience by showing them hey, you know what, Jeremy, the therapist is a human. And my God, I have kids. And sometimes I want to hit the mute button when I'm in the middle of a call. And it doesn't work like that because this is reality. Other times I want to bring them in, have them sit in my lap and chat with whoever I'm talking to. Obviously, as a therapist, I can't do that because of HIPAA. But you know, when I'm doing something that's not therapy-esque, I could do that kind of stuff. And it's okay. And it's all right to also show understanding. So, you know, anecdotal stuff like, hey, you know, at home, I feel, you know, a little weird because like for me, like I, I get so used to this bougie life we have at Common Desk and we have like people like Jenna that make like the best spot on coffee and they actually weigh it like by the gram. You guys are so accurate. It makes me laugh because when I do it, it's like shoveling a scoop and like hoping it comes out like motor oil. You know, I think things like that we get used to and this is our, our environment and our setting. But, you know, things that you miss, like share things you miss about the environment, share things you miss about the engagement with others, but also that exemplifying the behavior you want to exist in is just showing an openness. And instead of being that worrisome mindset and being like, I'm stuck, I can't ask questions, I don't want to, you know, have the HR person come in and slap me on the wrist for saying something or doing something that's too much or too little, then, hey, I can share about me, but I can share with purpose and intention so that I don't go too depth and then, you know, I'm going, you know, ensuring something that could be problematic and, you know, make people question me, but also I'm showing a little bit of my own humanity and my own vulnerability. That's awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, hey, well, no problem, Jay. I, I'm glad to do it. I saw you said make it a safe space. But yeah, anybody else? Is there something you'd like to address or any questions? I can pull that slide back up if I need to. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, howdy. Hey, so a question I have is, especially right now during this season where there's a lot of unknowns, mm-hmm. as far as a leader that is consciously intentional about my interactions with my team and the students and my clientele, how many times can you say, I don't know, before it's scary? Okay. So uh, with right now, like, and cause I know, you know, I know you personally, Lily, and I know that, you know, you own a business and you own a business is a barber, a barbering academy. And so absolutely deeply affected by, you know, shutdowns and shelter in place and, and things like that. And, you know, when we're sustaining prolonged, you know, experiences like that, it could start to weigh on you because you're holding up, you know, it's like, you know, you're the, you're, you're the, the classic, you know, the, the Dutch boy with his finger in the dam, you know, you're, you're trying to keep it from leaking, but then, you know, things keep coming out and it keeps, the water keeps pouring. Point being is it's not a hopeless cause, but it takes a lot of your repetitiveness and your intention and repeating and staying consistent. But also when you start to feel a little woesome or stressful about like that, the I don't know, then what do I not know? what is it that I, I am concerned with and what is it that I can actually can control? And so I always, you know, I try to remind people is when we talk about control, it's about understanding self and being so kind to yourself and not saying that everything's okay. I do nothing wrong. That's no, that's, that's BS. I'm not saying you don't take responsibility. What we do is you take responsibility. What is actually truthful and purposeful and actually what you can do versus what you can't do. Because we can't control a pandemic. We can't control the spread of a a virus. We can't just willfully wish something away through meditation. We have to address reality. 
And what the realities are is we're in this situation where businesses are literally on hold. We're pausing. Our whole existence has come to a, a halt almost is what it feels like. And that can weigh you down, especially if you're in the position of having to put out the persona of joy and happiness and success and like taking everyone in and giving them the, you know, the group hug and saying, we're in this together. It could be tiresome on you because who's doing that for you? And so if you're in that position, that's where you really got to get like in the weeds with self and just stress, what am I feeling? What is going on? Let me explore this. Let me talk to somebody. You know, if you have another person that's in the business realm, maybe, you know, that someone to communicate with on a more interpersonal level. Um, you know, if it's something you can do on your own, I've got some great breakdowns that I can send people about exploring self and your values and your purpose. But also, you know, it's utilize your resources is a big thing because that's something that happens is we take responsibility for others. So this could be you in the leadership role, like you own a company or a business or you're the supervisor, but it could also come from just our abilities. And here's another therapy term I'll throw at you is, you know, some of us on this call were empaths. And so this empaths means you're empathic, means you like, are you like a sponge? Other people's emotions, their thoughts, when they share them, you just feel them and you absorb them and you make them your own. Totally cool if you're like Professor X and X-Men you know, and you can see the future and great things can happen. However, we're not Professor X, we're human, and we're not special mutants. Some of us may be a little better than others, but the problem with empathic thinking is our empathic thinking takes us off our own track. And when we get derailed from our own track, we're trying to be a train without rails, pretty hard to go forward. So we will push everybody else along and then we'll get off the track and say, mm, I'm good, I don't know. And then we kind of just, see yourself seek you know seeping into ambivalence if a train is off a track and it's spinning its wheels it's going to get a rut and it's going to get stuck and so that's where we got to be like hey how do i get my ass back on this track how do i get forward momentum how do i build this so that i have better understanding because when i feel that scare and that woe instead of me just trying to navigate around it by avoidance it's hey let me look at it see it let me express it and identify it and own it so therefore I can get to the best example of myself. So then I am exemplifying that behavior I want to exist in. So then I am not overwhelmed and I am not overburdened with this doubt, or this fear, this unknown, because the real deal is we can't control some of these things. It is absolutely, you know, a transition of mind when you're allowed to sit with something with such magnitude and not feel overwhelmed and not feel anxious and not feel panicked and not watch 24 hours of BS news cycle. It's seeing it as an objective truth, fact-based thinking. So then we can be kind to ourselves and be considerate, and then we can build a positive mind frame. So I mentioned that earlier. When I talk about positive mind frame, what I mean by that is it's not this aloof response to things and everything is awesome like the Lego movie. It's about, hey, I'm framing my own thought process to be aware, so aware that when something comes in my existence, good, bad, ugly, and different, I can see it for what it is and how it is weighted and valued at its absolute truth. I peel back all the layers and I see the core existence. So I'm not going to be guessing because something we do as empathic thinkers is we will assume emotions. So we do uh, fortune telling. So we will think we know what someone's thinking or what they will do if we tell them something. So we will in our head come to a conclusion <laughs> about something that we haven't even talked about to somebody. And therefore we will take action on what we assume would occur. I don't know if anybody else has ever done that. I've totally done it. And I have to like pull back from my, like, you know, my, my Ouija board and shut the hell up because I will push myself to this, like, Oh, I've got an idea. I know how this is going to work. And then I'm going to get totally surprised by, Oh wait, you were absolutely wrong. Or, Oh wait, there's a lot more understanding that was needed. So we have to pull back from that kind of process. But it, being an empath is not a fault. I think it is an absolute beauty because being an empath allows you to find an emotional connection to people's needs and you engage them with more meaning and purpose of yourself. However, being an empath also is dangerous in the sense that if we go past the boundary lines that we should have established, then we will be outside of where we need to operate and you could do it temporarily, but long-term it's not sustainable. It would get exhausting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Lily, I kind of wanted to speak to that as someone who um, like follows just the, um, I I'm looking towards my leaders for giving me like information about what's going on or what's next. And just in, in my experience, I, uh, first of all, like the, 
my leaders have established like who they are and what kind of leaders they are beforehand. And so I trust them and I have this like built up trust. And then just again, the type of communicator that I am, I really value honesty. And so I trust that when they say they don't know, it's not because like they're not planning or they're not this. Like I would much rather them like over communicate the fact that like, Hey, yeah, we don't really know right now. Like, Hey, we don't, we still don't really know right now. Then feeling like I'm shut in the dark. I think that's scarier than, you know, this unknown thing. Cause we're all in this mm-hmm. unknown. I don't know. That That's just my experience. And I hope that it brings you some sort of comfort. I, I don't know you, but I, I'm sure that you're an excellent leader and, and have built that rapport as well. So. Thank you, Olivia. Appreciate the feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's important to just get the different dynamics. So like you sharing that, Olivia, it's really kind of you to open up because that allows other people to see insight from different perspectives and see that, hey, you know, what what actually resonates to the person and getting that feedback's vital. Because like for me, I'm I, no matter what I say, you guys, it's it's okay. Our, our, our implicit and explicit bias and implicit bias you experience with me is, oh, Jeremy's that therapy dude. He's going to be talking all that therapy trash and trying to get me excited about addressing it is what it is and how to build my mindset. So there's going to be a flaw with something I say, because it's no matter what happens, we're going to find a way to judge and assess. And then we're either going to, you know, we're going to evaluate it and make it valuable in our own existence, or we're going to discredit it because, hey, we've had something experienced that was similar or told us different. So this may not be really something that affects me. So point being is it's good to get feedback from others and get to hear their understanding from their perspective and their role. So thank you for that. So, um, but yeah, you know, I think that the, it's, it's great to get to open up this conversation and it's kind of neat when you get to get on a call and talk to people and when you open yourself up to a little bit of this vulnerability and a little bit more of just truthful exploration, it's amazing the depth and connection and the trust alliance you build because I don't know some of you and some of you I haven't even spoken to before this call, but I feel comfortable talking to you this way as I would talk to anybody that's in my practice, because this is something that I've had to work at and practice. Believe me, if we could have a time machine and, you know, I was Doc Brown and you're Marty McFly and we went back to Jeremy on active duty in the military, way different experience. And this is my point is we adapt and we evolve. We are who we are at our core and we've built that existence over time. You know, I don't think we need to change who we are and do it differently and never be the same person because I think that's problematic because then we flaw ourselves and tell ourselves that what we did before was not good enough and we can't address and accept the growth that we've had because of those experiences. You know, I know for me, I used to be an extremely angry person. I used to work at basic training for the Air Force. So part of my job was motivating through uh, positive reinforcement, also known as scaring the crap out of people and yelling at them. So, you know, I, me taking that is an experience that I had and part of the personal struggles and challenges I had when I got injured and got medically retired, you know, I had to really take this adaptation and adjustment and I had to like re-explore my whole identity and I had to do some real humble, no BS, like get down in the weeds thinking to address who I am, what I want to be and how I'm going to accomplish that. And it's a growth. It is growing and growing and never letting yourself feel so weighted with self-judgment that something you did was not good enough. It was an experience. You had a challenge, you had a bump in the road. I've never been fired except for one job. And that was after I'd already served in the military. I took that so personally and I did this whole deep dive into, oh my God, what happened? What did I do? What did I not do, et cetera. And so you really weigh yourself down when something like that unexpectedly can occur. Point being is you get past it and you move forward. You can either be obsessed with it and just focus on that problem, or you can build a pathway forward. You know, some of us on this call, you may be on the verge of unemployment, or you have somebody who is underemployed in your household, or unemployed in your existence, in your family, and it's tough to talk to them, because A, it reminds us of what could potentially be our future, and that could be scary, but B, it also makes us feel this guilt, because how can I provide for them when I have to provide for myself? So, some of this process we're doing here, we can practice on our own and then we can take it and use the momentum forward for others and we can share it with them and make it your own personal nuanced experience. So that way it comes off like it's something that you can connect with and you can resonate because me saying it is going to be totally different than somebody else in this call saying it. And that's totally fine. 
But the point is, is, hey, how do I build this structure out and make it valuable to myself so I can actually practice it so then I can share it and take it forward to somebody else and give them a resource and an active tool that they can use daily in their life versus telling them, oh, I hope it gets better because G. Willikers, you're the best. Awesome. However, we're not getting into that depth that we seek. Remember the projection versus the embodiment we talked about earlier. Um, but yeah. I'm take a take a minute here. Anybody got questions, feedback, anything? I saw a little, per, little person on screen. Howdy. So but um let's see here time wise. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um any other questions on there that I can answer or anything kind of kind of a, as a, a wrap up for you guys here? Well, I appreciate everybody that is able to join. And if you're watching the recording, uh, again, I'm Jeremy. I'm a therapist based out of Dallas uh, at the downtown Dallas uh, Common Desk location. Um, my website, it's www.mindabove.app, so mindabove.app. Um, you know, if you guys have questions, you want more resources and support, feel free to reach out to me. You can contact me by phone, by email. Uh, you can absolutely, if you're on the common desk Slack thing, I'm on there as well. You drop a line anytime. I'm glad to answer questions. And if there's something that we addressed today that hits you in a good or bad way, let me know. I love feedback and I love hearing from you guys. And that's a way for me to grow and make sure that I'm resonating with the people that I come into contact with either as a client or as in someone that I work with through doing, you know, things like this lunch and learn and presentations. So feedback is vital for me as well. Um, and you know, I appreciate honest, truthful feedback. Um, I know if you go, you know, online and we, something I always encourage people to do in these times are like, well, how do I support businesses and stuff like that is, you know, I know that I try to make a point to when I can't go to a place in person remind myself, Hey, did I ever, you know, go and give them like something as simple as a review can help them drive more people to understand, you know, connecting to what they do. So it's something I always encourage and you could do that for common desk even. You know, uh, the review kind of stuff helps just make sure people see an awareness and a currency of what's going on and what people feel. And if anybody feels encouraged to leave a review for me, make it honest. Don't don't try to make me feel good about myself. Be completely blatantly honest with how you experience things with me and how you express and identify and whatever you feel the connection to. Absolutely share it. That's absolutely fine. I got to own who I am and I've got to own how I present. So I'd rather people see it with their perspective of, you know, of, of others as opposed to me trying to, you know, pad my stats. But you guys are fantastic. Um, I, Olivia, is there anything I need to, to roll up or finish up on? Nope, that was excellent. I know that, yeah, it was very helpful for me. And I have some questions I'm going to DM you about later. Yeah, absolutely. So thank absolutely. you so much for your time. Absolutely. All right. Well, you guys have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you hey, so much. Lisa, you're welcome.